Uh, th thank you. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. <coughs> so my, uh, my goal for this week is to give some introduction to some of the algorithms that are used for knots and manifold recognition, mostly based on the work that came out of Hawkins' uh, ideas. But uh, today I want to give some, some history of how some of these things uh, evolved, particularly in the uh, 50s and 60s. So uh, I'm going to focus on two questions, the unknotting problem, to try and tell whether a knot is a trivial knot or not. And you can think of this as a special case of manifold recognition. Unknotting is, is sort of appealing because uh, it gives us a specific type of manifold to work with that we can visualize very well. But many of the techniques uh, that I'll talk about uh, generalize immediately to more general uh, three-dimensional manifolds. So uh, first we should think about what do we mean by a knot. So usually we think of knots as being embeddings of curves in three space up to some equivalence, such as isotopy. But generally when we look at knots, we look at pictures of them in the plane, these graphs that we saw this morning, for example, knot diagrams, and sometimes it's important to distinguish between the two. So when we study these knots, we can uh, use various categories, we can work with, for example, either smooth or polygonal knots, and those give equivalent theories. And then there's various ways to try and tabulate these things or draw them so that we can discuss them. The easiest way to think about knots if you're creating uh, algorithms or computer software is as a as a polygon in R3. So that would be one standard input that this was, a, I think, the original way people thought about them, just as a sequence of points in R3. And you can make the points integers by scaling. But we'll also see some equivalent definitions and, uh, or formulations. And some of the questions we can ask about knots is, well, the thing people thought about right from the beginning is can we classify them? So can we create some list in which every knot appears once? And uh, closely related is can we recognize a knot? So the unknot is an example, but But we can think about this for, for any, uh, any pair of knots. So if we have two pictures of, of knots, maybe even two in those pictures up there, we can ask whether they really represent different knots or perhaps they're the same knot. So knot recognition is, is actually equivalent to knot classification in general. Uh, we can ask how hard it is. So we can start looking at complexity issues. This was actually only done quite, a, quite recently. So the, the original algorithms that were created paid no attention to complexity issues. In fact, when, I think that when, uh, when, for example, Hawken created his first, al the first known algorithm for solving the unknotting problem, it's around the end of the 50s, uh, the idea of computational complexity had not yet been formulated. Uh, so, so uh, complexity issues, running times, c came a little later. So one, one intriguing question is uh, that, w that actually motivated uh, um, me when I started looking into this problem was the idea that maybe topology could say something interesting about complexity classes. So, very, very little no is known um, on a theoretical basis about the overlap or non 
non-equivalence of different complexity classes. And topology problems such as unknotting have some very special types of uh, properties that, that make, make you hope that maybe they could help you uh, understand some of these complexity class questions. So, for example, looking ahead a, a little bit, uh, one can show that this unknotting problem lies in the complexity class NP and in the complexity class co-NP. It's one of the not so many problems that lies in both of these classes. Uh, it's not known whether it lies in the class P. So that's, that's a sort of a, a central question where unknotting uh, plays a fairly rare role. Uh, also rather unusual, usually when problems are known to be uh, NP or co-NP, it's fairly easy to establish at least one of those. So for example, if, if you take a problem like graph coloring, which I'll show you in a minute, um, it's, if, if a graph has a coloring with three colors, it's very easy to demonstrate that. You just show a picture with the three colors. Uh, it's in knotting, both, both uh, the algorithms for knotting, uh, the, the, the non-knotting algorithm, it, it's very difficult to show that it's NP and it's difficult to show that it's co-NP. This is uh, quite unusual in, in algorithmic problems. So we'll look at some of that. Um, there's an interesting question about what type of undecidable problems arrive in the study arise in the study of knots in three manifolds. And I'm going to, one of the things I want to do today, that in fact the main thing I, the main theoretical thing I want to do today is show you uh, a little bit about why recognition problems in higher dimensions are undecidable. So I want to talk a little bit about the undecidable, undecidability of higher dimensional manifold recognition. And uh, it turns out that by studying these types of algorithmic questions about manifolds, we actually led to, uh, to new results in classical theory. So in particular, it turns out there's a, lot of, there's a lot of interesting connections between complexity theory and areas, computing areas of uh, curves, and lengths of curves and areas of surfaces. So this is... Um, a standard topic in differential geometry, and I'm going to show you some classical results in differential geometry that come out of these, uh, these algorithmic questions about topology. And we can ask similar questions about manifolds. Can we classify manifolds, recognize manifolds, and so on? So it, knots, I think, uh, can be thought of as just special ca cases of manifolds, namely the the exterior for knot in the three sphere is a manifold. Uh, and many of the techniques work just as well for general manifolds, three-dimensional manifolds. So in topology in dimensions two and three, there's uh, these three categories that people look at. And the first two, smooth and piecewise linear, are more or less equivalent. The third one's a little bit different. You have more pathological behavior that can occur. So for example, in the smoother, the uh, piecewise linear setting, you, uh, you have theorems that say that uh, two spheres in R3 bound balls. But that's not true in the continuous setting. As shown by the Alexander Horn sphere at the bottom right. So when we're working with algorithms, it's natural to stick to the piecewise linear setting. So it's completely equivalent to the smooth setting for everything we do. So if we want to describe an object in an algorithm, a topological object in an algorithm, the standard method we'll use is 
to set things up using simplicial complexes. So a simplicial complex will just be a collection of vertices, edges, triangles, tetrahedra. And they'll have the property that any subset of uh, the vertices in a simplex also defines a simplex. So these are very easy data structures to implement. And with those, we can set up, for example, a knot as a collection of edges in a three-dimensional simplicial complex, which is homeomorphic to a three-sphere. And a simplicial complex is an n-manifold, is represents in manifold if some simple properties hold, namely, if you look around every facet, the linking complex around that facet is a sphere of appropriate dimension. So I don't want to get into the details of how things are set up, but PL topology is well set up to deal with algorithmic questions of topology. And already, when we think about the definitions, we see questions, how can we determine if a simplicial complex really represents a manifold, leads to the question of sphere recognition. We have to decide if the link around every face is a sphere. So we have a link that will, that, that's a particular simplicial complex that's derived from our problem. And we, need, we would like to have some algorithm to determine if it's a sphere. Well, let's, let's turn to knots. So this is a collection of, uh, of knots, and we'd like, to, we'd like some systematic way of recognizing and classifying them. So in particular, the knot recognition problem says that if we're presented two different knots, or two, two knots, can we tell whether they're the same or different? Okay, so it's not as easy as the first picture showed uh, sometimes. Uh, we get very complicated knots in many settings. For example, biologists look at viruses and try and tell what their knotting patterns are. They, they get pictures that look roughly like the ball at the left. And uh, our intuition isn't actually that good as to whether things are knotted or not. Uh, that curve on the, on the left isn't a knot, and it's sometimes quite hard to tell. There's some efforts uh, underway at Microsoft to use machine le learning to, to determine on knots, but uh, that's still a project that hasn't, uh, hasn't come to fruition. So here, here's some pictures of on knots. Well, none of them look particularly unknotted, but, uh, but they all are. And uh, the question is, how can we systematically recognize that these really are unknotted? Here's one that Hawken uh, gave. Here's an example that Hawken uh, gave of an unknot. If you look at this, there's no obvious way to there's no obvious place to pull at it to simplify it. Here's another example due to Hawken of a non knot. So, here's some of the basic algorithmic questions that I want to talk about this week. There's uh, the unknotting problem, where, and for the, math, for the people who are mathematicians, this is the the way that uh, algorithms are often described. There's a, a problem, which is given a name, which is always in capitals for some reason. And then there's an instance and a question. So an instance is a particular case of the problem you're looking at. In for knotting, it's a particular knot. And it'll be described in some way, perhaps as a polygon or as a simplicial complex. It doesn't really matter because any two concrete descriptions usually will 
give a, provide a way of going from one to the other. So the particular data structure you use isn't so important. But there will be some, some way of formulating what a knot is, and that's given as an instance. And then you ask the question, is K unknotted? Or if you have a link with two components, is, the split is it a split link? Is there a way of finding a two-sphere in R3 such that each component lies on distinct sides of the two-sphere? The knot genus problem says, uh, given a knot, asks the question, what is the smallest cipher surface, what is the genus of the smallest cipher surface spanning the knot? And uh, the knot recognition problem says, given a pair of knots, are they equivalent? And Hawkins' theorem, and I'll at least uh, show you enough about Hawkins' theorem to prove the first two uh, over the next couple of days, will answer all these problems, all four of these. So these, these can all be algorithmically decided. And this was very much up in the air until Hawken gave this solution. Not everything has an algorithm, though. You shouldn't think that every question about knots admits an algorithmic solution. So one still open question is whether there's an algorithm to compute the unknotting number of a knot. So the unknotting number is illustrated on that little diagram on the right, you have a picture of the knot and you can change a crossing. You can let, let the knot pass through itself some number of times. And if you allow yourself to pass through the knot enough times, you'll get a knot. A knot. So the minimal number of times that you need to pass the knot through itself to get an unknot is called the unknotting number. And this still does not have an algorithmic solution as, as far as I know. Yes? Well, no, this is not an unknot. This is a knot. It's a non-trivial knot. So, for example, over here you start with the trefoil, right? And if you, cha if you change one crossing, if you move the red strand underneath the blue strand there, then it becomes the unknot. So that means the unknotting number of the trefoil is one. You can change one crossing and get the unknot. Let me, let me, there's a question. Suppose you start with a very complicated drawing of the unknot. Yes. Is that the question also workable? Or? What's the question? What's the end in that case? Zero. Yeah. No, it's a knot. It's an invariant of a knot. So I drew it as, as if you're doing it for a particular diagram. But in fact, you may have to isotop the knot around and then change the crossing, and then move it around and then change another crossing. The, it may not be apparent what to do from a particular diagram. Maybe that was your question, yeah. And that, that's actually what makes it difficult. Uh, so some history of unknotting. So we heard about Max Dane this morning. So he's coming up again, uh, uh, although rather different contribution by him. Uh, so he proposed this unknotting problem back in 1910. He asked for some systematic procedure to find whether a knot is trivial or not. And he didn't really ask for an algorithm because the notion of an algorithm hadn't been formulated yet at that time. Uh, I'll come back to Dane. Uh, but uh, it was 1961 before Dane's question was actually opened. It was actually solved by Hawken. And uh, starting tomorrow, I'm going to look at what Hawken did. The, idea of an algorithm wasn't available really in a rigorous way until uh, Turing. So Turing s defined some set of procedures for processing data called the Turing machine. And with that, you could formally define what an algorithm is. It's a 
It's a question that can be answered by a Turing machine. Okay, the way we can think about, so Turing machines are, are, are rather formal. Info, informally, an algorithm is just some problem that we can uh, work through, through some unambiguous procedure where we know exactly what to do at each step. And uh, we wind up with an answer to our question. And there's various types of things you can ask. You can ask how many elements are in a given set or, or uh, various other things. But we're just going to be looking at yes, no questions. So those kinds of questions are called decision problems. And just for those who may not be so familiar with, with examples, I thought I'd give three examples, uh, three well-known examples. Uh, the last one is, is uh, actually going to come up later, so I, I'll take the time to introduce it. So the three examples are graph, car car graph three coloring. So you're given a graph and you're asked whether you can color the vertices so that no two vertices connected by an edge have the same color and only use three colors. Prime, you're given an integer and asked is it prime? And satisfiability, sat, you're given a Boolean expression and asked if it's true. So let me give you an example of each of these. Here's two, ex two examples of graphs. The top graph is called the Peterson graph. And the bottom graph is the complete graph on five vertices. And we can ask in each case, is there an assignment of colors to the vertices which satisfies the three coloring property? And it turns out to be yes for the first graph. And you can see how to do it there. And the answer is no for the complete graph. And you can see that by just assigning, it doesn't matter what colors you use for up to permutation, we can assign those three colors to that triangle, and then there's no way to extend that to the fourth vertex. So this color, this graph, the answer is no. The prime problem, here's two integers. You asked if they're prime. This, uh, it's not, not too long ago was shown that this can be decided in polynomial time. The answer is yes for the first one and no for the second one. I won't, I won't say why. When w one is divisible by three. So it's, anyway, uh, and the third example is the satisfiability algorithm. The satisfiability question. So this is uh, actually a very important one in complexity theory because uh, you can reduce many other questions to this one. And later this week, I'll show how you can, trend, you can reduce a question about computing the genus of a surface to a problem in this type of uh, of, of, of this type about Boolean expressions. So here we have a bunch of, this is a Boolean expression. So you th think of each of x1, x2, and so on as having the value true or false. And then you take triples of such things. So the first one is not x1 or x2 or not x3 or, or not y3. And then you just, uh, take conjunctions of these. So you just stay the first clause and the second clause and the third clause. And you ask, is there some assignment of, of true-false to the variables which makes the entire expression true? That's the satisfiability problem. And if you uh, look at the study of NP-complete problems, this is one of the NP-complete problems and it's, it's one that when people show things are NP complete, and there's 20, 30,000 problems today that are known to be NP complete, this is very often the problem that, that it's shown to be equivalent to. So for this example I gave, there is an assignment that makes that whole expression true. If you said x1 equals false, x2 equals true, and y3 equals false, then you can see that each of the 
each of these clauses is, is true. For example, the second one, not x1 or not x2 or y3, that's true because not x1 is true. x1 is false and so not x1 is true. And you can check that each of the other three is also true. So this is something that people in complexity theory uh, spend a lot of time studying this problem. Well, let's go back to Dane. So Dane asked this question about unknotting, and he had an approach to it which, uh, which involved transforming this topological question about whether a knot is trivial into an algorithmic problem in algebra. So this is actually sort of fascinating historically. Uh, unknotting has had a long relationship to the theory of algorithms. This is, this is uh, one of its connections. Uh, Dane was really uh, one of the historical figures in the development of algorithms and, and, algor and, the, def and, and the idea of asking for algor algorithms to solve problems. And this unknotting problem was uh, the focus of his attention in that area. So it's, in a way, it's connected with the early days of computer science, theoretical computer science. So Dane's, uh, Dane's idea was, let's look at the fundamental group of the knot complement, the knot group, which is a certain group. And there was already known a simple way to describe this group. Wurdinger had describe what's known as the Wurdinger representation. So given a knot or a knot diagram, you could produce a certain presentation for a group. And Dane's idea was to check whether that group is infinite cyclic. So he stated what is called Dane's lemma, which says that a knot is trivial if and only if its group is, is isomorphic to the integers, is isomorphic to z. This is uh, one way of stating Dane's lemma. And Dane, Dane published this uh, in the 20s, I think. Uh, unfortunately, there was a mistake in his proof, which was discovered by Johansson. And people tried to fix it for many years. It was finally successfully uh, fixed by Papa Kirikopoulos in 1957. So Dane's lemma is correct, although Dane didn't have a proof. So this is, this is correct, and it, it gives us a way of trying to test algebraically whether a knot represents or not is equivalent to the trivial knot. Namely, we can compute its fundamental group, the fundamental group of the exterior of the knot, and ask whether that group is isomorphic to the infinite cyclic group. So can we answer that question? Well, it turns out that we can't. So this is a little unfortunate. 1957, Papa Kirikopoulos finally proves Dane's lemma. And like within a year or two, it's proven that this kind of problem can't be solved by that method. So there was a series of uh, results originating in work of Novikov and Boone that showed that a whole class of problems, such as deciding whether a group is isomorphic to the integers, cannot admit algorithmic solutions. There's no algorithm to solve such problems. So these were among the first undecidable problems that were found in mathematics. Let me, let me say a little bit about these. So the history of these, uh, there's four problems here. Each of them is undecidable, so there's no algorithm to, to answer the questions that they, that they pose. The history really goes back to Cantor, because if, if you really trace back the arguments for why these are undecidable, it, it fundamentally comes down to this very simple idea of Cantor's diagonal argument that uh, uh, which he used to show that the reals and the, and the integers had different cardinality. But the same ideas were used by Hilbert Gödel, 
Turing to, to show various undecidable, undecidable results in different settings. Um, the word problem was shown to be undecidable by Markov in 1951. There was some more progress by Novikov, Adi, and Boone, and Rabin extended these ideas to various questions about different types of groups. The one, uh, the one I'm going to look at in particular is the triviality problem. So in this one, you have a, you have a finitely presented group. So you have a group, and you have m generators for it. and a collection of n relations, and you ask, is this group isomorphic to the trivial group? So this is an undecidable problem, and one consequence of it is that you cannot recognize n-dimensional manifolds. So this was, this was proven uh, in 1958, and shortly afterwards, Novikov showed that uh, you can't even recognize the, the n-sphere. So there's no algorithm to decide for n greater or equal to 5 if a closed five-dimensional manifold is S5. Now, there is an algorithm to tell whether the one or the one or whether a one or two dimensional manifold is the one sphere or the two sphere. About uh, 15, 20 years ago, there was an art argument by uh, Rubinstein and Thompson that showed how to recognize the three dimensional sphere, and I'm going to talk about that this week. It has some, some beautiful ideas in it. And it's still not known whether the four, four sphere is recognizable. That case uh, remains unknown. So I, wanted, I thought uh, I'd actually show you Markov's theorem. I'd try and go through the proof of Markov's, Markov's theorem that there's no algorithm to recognize the four, recognize four dimensional manifolds, to tell if two four dimensional manifolds are homeomorphic. So, I've done a little random survey and asked people if they knew the argument. Uh, so everybody who thinks they know the argument says, well, it's got, it just reduces to the word problem. But actually, it's a little trickier than that. Uh, Markov actually had a, a quite, a, you know, there's, some, there's a subtlety in the argument, and it, it doesn't immediately follow from the group theory argument. So I, I, I thought I'd, I'd show you what the argument is. So what we're going to do to show that there are four manifolds that cannot be recognized, that we cannot determine whether they're homeomorphic manifolds, the way we're going to do that is we're going to construct a certain four manifold, and we're going to show that if we can determine whether that, so we'll call that manifold M, and we're going to say that if we can determine whether that manifold is diffeomorphic to a connect sum of n S2 cross S2s, so S2 cross S2 is a particular four manifold, and connect sum is an operation where you glue four manifolds together by removing four balls and gluing together along the three sphere boundary you create. So we're going to construct a four dimensional manifold with the property that we can answer whether it's diffeomorphic to connect sum of S2 cross S2s if and only if a certain group, G, is isomorphic to the trivial group. So we'll start with a presentation of a group, and we'll show that if we can recognize this four-manifold we, cons we construct, then we can determine whether G is the trivial group. This is called a reduction. Hmm? So there's a connection with n copies. N is the number of relators. So we have a we start with a 
presentation with m generators and n relations of a group. And then we're going to construct a certain manifold, and that manifold is going to be homeomorphic or diffeomorphic, either one, to connect sum of S2 cross S2s if and only if G is trivial. Now, we can't answer in general the question of whether that group is trivial or not. That's one of the undecidable problems. So that means that four manifold recognition is also trivial. This is called a reduction in complexity theory. We've taken one problem and reduced it to another one. This says that, uh, that four manifold recognition is harder than triviality. But triviality is already undecidable. So to see how to construct them, I have to use a little bit of Morse theory. Morse theory tells us if we're given a group, how to construct a manifold whose fundamental group is equal to that group. So let me just give you a, a quick introduction to Morse theory. In Morse theory, you build manifolds up using handles. Handles are balls which are glued to, glued successively onto a ball until you get any smooth manifold. So a one handle is a neighborhood of an interval. Here we have, I'm going to be looking at five dimensional manifolds. So a one handle for us will be an interval, the one disk, crossed with a four ball, the four disk. So it's a D1 cross D4. And I'm going to attach it to, to uh, a four manifold that I've already started constructing by its boundary, which is a zero sphere cross D4. So it's just like that half a donut that you see there. That is a three dimensional ha one handle. It's, it's got an interval cross D2, and it's attached to the ground along an S0 cross D2. So we're just going to kick that up two dimensions. And a two handle is very similar. This is a three dimensional two handle. It's a D2, the bowl is a D2 cross D1. In five dimensions, we take a D2 cross D3, and we're going to glue it onto a manifold using an S1 cross D3. So that's, uh, that's five dimensional one and two handles. It's really just these pictures crossed with D2. So Morse theory says we can build all kinds of things with handles, any smooth manifold. There's a manifolds there. So how do, we, how do we do this? Well, we start with a ball, in our case a five ball, and then we start attaching handles to construct a, to construct a space whose group is, is given by this, this uh, pr presentation that, that we're given. So let's look, for example, how, what we would do. We'd start with a five ball. And to add a generator, G1, we attach a one handle. So that's a, a neighborhood of an arc. So it's an arc cross B4 in five dimensions. And we attach it by its two boundary, the, boundary, the two boundary points of that arc cross B4. So we get something like it left. And as you can see, in three dimensions, you'd get a solid torus when you did that. In five dimensions, you'd get an S1 cross D4. I'll do it again. Now pi 1 is the free product of, uh, of two z's. That should be a free product. So it's the free group on two generators when we do it twice. And now we're going to attach a two handle. So the instructions for attaching a two handle, in order to understand how to attach a two handle, we have to know where that where that boundary S1 gets attached. So the boundary S1 is, is that circle, that green circle at the bottom. And we've attached it here so that it runs twice over the, hand, the one handle on the left and once over the one handle on the right. And when you 
use Van Kampen's theorem or something similar to figure out what the fundamental group becomes, you'll see that you've killed off G1 squared times G2. So that becomes a relation. And this group becomes isomorphic to the integers. So we can do something similar with any group. If we have enough room to glue these curves onto the previously if onto the previous construction without creating any intersections. So five dimensions is plenty enough to do that. Now the other thing we need to understand is that sometimes handles can cancel. So what do I mean by cancel? Well I've started with a ball and I've added a one handle there so I've got a solid torus or the five dimensional equivalent. And if I added a two handle off to the side somewhere, it wouldn't affect that one handle. But if I added a two handle so that it just ran over that, five ha that one handle once, then it cancels the one handle. And you can see it's, it's the same as doing nothing. You can take that, the union of the one handle and the two handle and just deform them back into the five ball. You've created a hole and then filled in the hole. So that's called handle cancellation. When a two handle runs over a one handle once, it cancels the one handle. Now, sometimes it may not be apparent that the two handle runs over the one handle once. So here I've sort of deformed the attaching circle by pulling it over the one handle again. That doesn't change the, four the five manifold we get. So the point is that it doesn't really matter how, how the things look. What matters is if you can isotop, if you can deform the handles so that one of, them, one of the two handles run, runs once over the one handle, then that one handle will be canceled with that two handle. OK, so let's look at an important example for Markov, S2 cross S2. If I have no one handles and just attach a two handle to, to the five ball, what do I get? Well, in dimension three, you just get a thickened two sphere. You attach a dome to a ball, you'll get an S2 cross an interval in three space. And in five space, you'll, you'll get an S2 cross B3. You'll just thicken everything by two dimensions. If we have a bunch of two handles that we've attached to a five ball, we'll get a connect sum of S2 cross B3s. And the boundaries of these S2 cross B3s are S2 cross S2s. And in this case, we'll get the boundary will be connect sum of S2 cross S2s, one for each two handle. So here's a question, does, does it matter how we attach these two handles? Is there any choice here? It only matters what the isotopy class of the curve on the boundary of the two handle is. And in a four dimensional manifold like S4, there's only one isotopy class of curves, right? There's no knotted curves in S4. There's, not, there's too many dimensions to have knots. You can pass a curve right through itself in, in four dimensions. So, there's only one way. Now, actually, there's a sort of a twisted way as well, but we can avoid that. So let me. There's a. The, the, there's a there's a, another framing for an S1, in S4, but we'll avoid doing that. So, that's just a technical issue. So essentially, there's one way to connect to attach a two handle. And, it will give us on the boundary a connect sum of S2 cross S2s. Okay, so now we know we have all the Morse theory we need for Markov's theorem. We're going to show that if we can recognize four manifolds, then we can solve the triviality problem for groups. So let's start with a group presentation. And now what we'll do is construct a five-dimensional manifold W whose fundamental group equals that group. So how do we do that? Well, we start with the five ball. Its boundary is the four sphere. And now for each generator of the group, we add a one handle. 
So there's M generators, so we add M1 handles, four in this example. And now we want to add some two handles. I've just drawn one. We want to add some two handles, one for every relation, that follow the relation. So this relation corresponding to this, to this uh, two handle says go over the first one handle once and go over the fourth, go over the uh, second one handle, then go over the fourth one handle, then go back backwards over the second one handle, and we'll see something like that. Okay, so we'll do one of these two handles for every relation, and Morse theory then tells us that we have some five manifold with the right fundamental group. Now, why did we use a five manifold instead of a four manifold when we want to prove something about non recognizability of four manifolds? Well, this is a, this five manifold is not closed, it has boundary. Right? We want to get a closed manifold. So we're going to look at the boundary of this five-dimensional manifold. That has no boundary. And the claim is that the boundary of this five-dimensional manifold has the same fundamental group as the five-manifold. So the boundary of W has the same fundamental group as W. And why is that? Well, let's look at the idea can be seen here. If I have a curve in the three-ball, here I've drawn at the lower left a three-ball, says it's a five ball, but you can actually see it as a three ball here. And if I remove the center point of that ball, then I claim that pi one of the boundary is the same as pi one of the three ball minus a point. They have the same fundamental group. Why is that? Well, if I take a curve, like that blue curve, I can push it out to the boundary, right? Because that blue curve is one dimensional and the point is zero dimensional and we have three dimensions to move around with, the blue curve can be pushed off the, the black point at the center. And once it's off, you can just radially push out to the boundary. And now if I have another curve that's homotopic to this blue curve, so if I see some annulus running between two curves, I can push that whole annulus out to the boundary also. Because an annulus is two dimensional and we have a co-dimension three point there in the middle, so we can make them, the whole annulus miss that point. So we can push the whole annulus out to the boundary. So if we're talking about co-dimension three stuff, we can push curves out to the boundary. If we, push it, if we want to miss something of co-dimension three, we can push curves out to the boundary and, and we can push homotopies out to the boundary. Well, for these one and two handles, the one handle has a core which is one dimension. So this, the center of that S1 cross B4 is a one dimensional S, is a one dimensional manifold and we can make any element of pi one of W, which is represented by some curve, miss the cores of the central arcs of those one handles. And we can also make them miss the central two disks of the two handles, which are co both co-dimension three or more. So that means that curves and homotopies can all be pushed out to the boundary of W. So the boundary of W has the same homotopy type as, as the, uh, the boundary has the same homotopy, first homotopy group as W. So this would be false, for example, on a disk. If, if you took a, a two-dimensional disk and you, and you took this curve and this curve, these are homotopic curves in the two-dimensional disk. But if we try to, and, and, and certainly we can push both of them out to the boundary. If we take this radial push out, which sends the complement of the origin out to the boundary, it will push both of these curves out to the boundary. But the homotopy connecting these two curves, there's a, a sort of annulus connecting these two curves, that cannot be made to miss this point. So we can't push the homotopy out to the boundary. That's why pi one of the complement of this, well, right, it's, it's why pi one of the disk is not homotopic to pi one of the circle. Because even though we can push curves out to the boundary, we can't push homotopies out to the boundary. 
But in five dimensions, we can. We cannot do this construction in four, four di dimensions. And that's why uh, three manifolds do not have undecidable uh, recognition problem. OK, so we've got a four manifold now, which is closed. It's the boundary of a five manifold. And it has the same fundamental group as W. So now I claim that I cannot determine whether that four manifold is homeomorphic to a connect sum of n s2 cross s2s. Well, actually, I, I step back for a minute. I have to do one more thing before I do that. So I'm going to do one more thing. I'm going to take this five manifold, which has gotten to have fundamental group G. And this is, I think, this really clever idea that Markov had. He said, let's add m more two handles. Let's add an additional m two handles off to the side. Trivial two handles. OK, so we're far away from where all the action is with the one handles and the two handles in another corner of this five ball, on, this, on another part of the four sphere far away, we're going to just add n trivial two handles. So we'll be essentially connect summing this with n s2 cross s2s. And now what Markov claims is that this manifold m, which is the boundary of this w prime, this final object here, this is diffeomorphic to a connect sum of s2 cross s2s if and only if g is the trivial group. OK, so that's, that's going to give us undecidability of the recognition problem. Because we, we're not going to be able to answer the question of G, whether G is the trivial group, so we're also not going to be able to answer the equivalent question of whether this is a connect sum of S2 cross S2s. OK, so there's two things to prove. We, have, we claim both these statements are equivalent. So if M is diffeomorphic to connect sum of S2 cross S2s, then certainly Certainly, its fundamental group is trivial. The fundamental group of connect sum of S cross S2s is trivial. But the fundamental group is isomorphic to G by this construction, right? The whole, the whole construction was to make the manifold M have a fundamental group isomorphic to G. So if it's diffeomorphic to S2 cross S2, then G is the trivial group. That's easy. What about the other direction? How can we see that if G is the trivial group, then this manifold is a connect sum of N S2 cross S2s? OK, so now is, this is where we use the dimension. Let's look at one of those green two handles, which is lies over, off to the side. So its attaching circle is a small circle far away from where anything else is happening. But we're assuming here that M is simply connected, right? And we're assuming that G is the trivial group and pi 1 of M is G. Right? So we're, we're, proving, we're assuming that G is the trivial group and we want to show that M is diffeomorphic to connect sum of N S2 cross S2. So since G is the trivial group, all curves in M are homotopic. But M is four-dimensional. That means all curves in M are isotopic as well. And in particular, we can slide one of those green guys. We can deform it by an isotopy so that it runs over one of the blue one-handles. Right? Because the curve going over one of the one-handles is, is homotopic to any other curve. Every, every curve is isotopic. So we can use those M2 handles, the green ones, to cancel the M blue one handles. We can have each of those green two handles run once over one of the blue one handles. So that every, once all the one handles cancel, then we're back to a five ball with boundary of four sphere. And then we think about the red two handles. They're all being attached to a four sphere. Well, there's only one way to attach a two handle to a four sphere, and that gives you an S2 cross S2. There's 
There's n of them, so we must have n copies of S2 cross S2. So that was Markov's argument. I, I went through it a little fast, but uh, it's, not, it's not completely uh, trivial. It's, it, it has this quite clever idea in it, and uh, it shows that if we could recognize four manifolds, we would be able to solve the triviality problem. So we can't. So this is a bit of a shock, maybe. Some of you graduate students might worry. Is your thesis problem decidable? So you know, this opens up this, this question about what problems that we're looking at are undecidable. Maybe some, this is a fairly natural problem, trying to recognize four manifolds, trying to recognize the four sphere. Still not known. But just around the same time as this is telling people that maybe a lot of topology problems are undecidable and too hard, Hawking finally show, solves the un, unknotting problem and shows that that is not undecidable. So that's one motivation for finding algorithms for topological problems is to show that they're not undecidable, that these problems really are approachable. So Hawkins results are almost at the same time. I said a little bit about Novikov's theorem that it's undecidable whether the five sphere or the n sphere for n greater or equal to five is, you cannot recognize Sn for n greater or equal to five. What's the idea of that? It's similar to Markov's result, but it has two additional ingredients. One is that you want this uh, manifold you construct, this uh, W, to be a homology sphere. So it turns out if, if you have a, a manifold which is a homology sphere and in addition is simply connected, then it's a homotopy sphere. So you have to do, you have to look not at general triviality problems, but at triviality problems for finitely presented groups whose homology is, has a special kind of property. And the second thing that went into Markov's, uh, into Novikov's theorem about unrecognizability of, of n spheres is uh, Smale's proof of the Poincare conjecture, which showed that a homotopy sphere is, is actually homeomorphic to a sphere, which was proven again just around that time, 1960 or so. So all these different things came together uh, to, to show Novikov's result. But it doesn't quite work in dimension four. You really need to go to five and above to, to make that work. Yes? Uh, it's also sort of back to the question, I mean, especially for spheres, I mean, the fact that it's undecidable in theory, I mean, if you just take a random example in the wild, is it also difficult? Because it, I have the impression that for spheres, it might not be that hard. It's a, that's a very good question. So the, these problems, uh, Right, so these problems are in a way worst case analysis in some sense. So you might, want, you might wonder if you came up with a, say you took a, a, a random, uh, some sort of random object that you get from gluing together 104 simplices and, and you want to decide if that's a sphere or not. So actually people have done experiments with that kind of thing. Uh, Frank Lutz's group in, in uh, Berlin has, has uh, done a lot of work uh, uh, experimentally sh testing whether high dimensional simplicial complexes are shellable and so on, whether you can shrink them down to a single simplex just by peeling off uh, triangles or n simplices one at a time and so on. And uh, the, I think the evidence is that you really do get stuck in naive algorithms once you start getting into higher dimensions and many simplices. Uh, but uh, I don't know if anybody Knows, knows more about that uh, than I do. But, but they do get stuck sometimes, I think. So it, I think it's not, just a, it's not just an artifact. Three dimensions is a little, is a little different. There, the, it may be that things are, in actual fact, much faster than our algorithms uh, tell us they'll be. OK, so now to, well, any other questions uh, before I move on from Markov's theorem? Yeah. 
Is what? A spherical? A spherical, yeah. yeah. Right, that's, that's a good question. Uh, it's certainly true that if, if you add, there are, I mean, people do know that if you add certain restrictions to the, wor to the groups you look at, then it becomes decidable. For example, if it's a three manifold group, then the problems become decidable. Uh, I don't know whether a spherical would be, would be a valid condition to add. So let's look at three manifolds. There's, I thought bef before I talked about the Hawking approach, I'd, I'd talk about some other approaches that are very natural for a nodding that people have looked at. So one approach is to try and use the geometric structures on a, on a manifold, which we now know exist. So Thurston back in 78 showed that all three manifolds have, all, all not complements have geometric structures and that was extended to all three manifolds by Perlman. And there's a result of Sella, which is really a, a group theory uh, result, which says that if you have two hyperbolic groups, then there's an algorithm to tell if they're isomorphic. And because of the structure of the geometrization theorem, that turns out to be the key case of determining whether two, th three manifolds are homeomorphic. So when you put all these results together, they do give you an algorithm com based on computing various, various fundamental groups to determine whether two, three manifolds are, are homeomorphic, and in particular, whether two knots are the same. Unfortunately, this is extremely impractical. This, this could never be implemented. It, its complexity, uh, I think, is at best uh, towers and towers of exponentials. Uh, and the reason is it doesn't use anything particular. Well, Sulla's argument is, is where the hang-up is. It doesn't use anything particular about the fact that the group is a three-manifold group. It, it works for arbitrary hyperbolic groups. And, and those uh, are much more complicated than the groups of hyperbolic three manifolds. But there's an approach that, that uh, people are looking at based on, on geom geometrization. A second approach, uh, which goes back perhaps to Alexander, is to try and compute some invariant, some simple invariant that will characterize knots or at least characterize the unknot. So the Alexander polynomial was an early one, more recently the Jones polynomial. It's still not known at this point whether the trivial knot is the only knot with Jones polynomial one. But these are pretty good. We're using these, uh, you know, if, if the, now we know there's 350 million uh, knots with up to 19 crossings, and you can distinguish with invariants like these, you can pretty much distinguish those. Uh, with a few extra arguments. They go a long way towards doing that. But, but more recently, these invariants have been extended. Uh, there's more invariants now for knots, knot floor homology, the A polynomial. These are three knot invariants that are known to distinguish the unknot now. The drawback of these is that they can be quite hard to compute. We don't really understand. They're, they're more combinatorial, I would say, than, than geometric or topological. So we, don't quite un, we often don't quite understand what it is they're tell us, telling us about the knot. And so they, they don't tell us much about the structure of a general three-dimensional manifold if we try to extend from knot theory. At least not yet. We, we have to understand them better. Whereas the advantage of the Hawking normal surface approach that we're going to look at this week is that it will extend to general three manifold problems. Um, so yes. 
I don't know. Couldn't tell you. Yeah. Somebody know? The, que the question was, what's this, do these, uh, sorry, I'm, I'm supposed to repeat the question. Uh, so the question was whether there are two non-trivial knots with the same Kovanov homology or a polynomial or not floor homology. These, these invariants distinguish the unknot, but do they actually tell apart uh, pairs of uh, knots or are these, are the, do these take the same value for some knots? Uh, so I, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, there's an approach to unknotting by Dinikov, which is based on books with three pages. So the idea here is that you can take a knot. This is, this is equivalent uh, to something you, you may have seen elsewhere called a grid diagram. You take a knot and you, you place it on three pages of a book in R3. And then there's moves that you're allowed to make where you flip a, an arc from one page to an adjacent page. Like, for example, that big red arc can be flipped to that small red arc, while the blue and the red can be flipped to the other blue and the red. And Dinikov studied these kinds of moves. <coughs> Certain types of simplifications uh, occur when you remove arcs. And Dinikov set, showed that this led to an unknotting algorithm essentially showed that it was monotonic. You never had to increase the number of points of intersection with the binding of that book, the central, the central curve. It's, it's still a doubly exponential algorithm, but it, it uh, was shown to, to apply in 1999. And, and this has actually been implemented in software to recognize the unknot. And in practice, it works uh, quite well on diagrams up to several hundred crossings, which is quite, quite a lot if you think about it. Uh, this, there's other software to recognize, and they also surprisingly will often give you answers for diagrams with hundreds of crossings. And one of the reasons is that, uh, that the first thing these uh, software packages do when, they, when you input a knot into them is they try and simplify it. They look for obvious simplifications. And it's very hard to create a diagram that doesn't have lots and lots of simplifications. You have to work hard to do that. So this 200 crossing diagram may simplify quite a bit just by some standard moves. I'll maybe show you some others. Another natural approach, this is very appealing and lots of people have uh, looked at this question, is work with the diagrams, the, these planar curves with, with over and under crossings, and try and directly work with them to determine whether you can somehow simplify a curve to get a trivial knot. So this, this is actually, uh, the study of diagrams is, is closely related to the study of knots, but actually it's quite interesting on its own. And uh, I'll give you some examples of that later. So a direct approach to a knotting is to somehow try to find ways to simplify, systematic ways to simplify diagrams until you get rid of all the crossings or get stuck. So diagrams can be, can be changed us using Reitermeister moves without changing the knot they represent. So here's a quick uh, example of some Reitermeister moves, right? There's a type one Reitermeister move. There's three types, there's a type two. Okay, that's a type two Reitermeister move. Uh, and there's a type three. <laughs> okay. <laughs> My, my PowerPoint uh, victory. 
Okay, so uh, the fact that the two diagrams represent the same knot w was proved by, uh, actually by both Reitermeister and Alexander Briggs independently in the same year, although um, they're called Reitermeister moves. And uh, it's, a, it's a very simple argument, uh, actually, but, but surprisingly not well known. It's, again, one of those things that, uh, anybody know the argument? Why these are the only three moves? Okay, some of you do. Who doesn't know the argument? A few people. Let me show you the argument. So, you know, sometimes, Reitermeister moves are taken just to be the definition of knots, not equivalent, right? You say two knots are the same if you can go from one picture to another picture by these diagrams. But that's not really the right definition. The, a knot is an object in R3. It's a polygon in R3. And the equivalence that you want for polygons is sliding across triangles, right? This is, uh, this is called an elementary move in PL topology. You look for a triangle that's disjoint from the knot, and you slide two edges of the triangle to the third, or you go backwards, slide one. So th this is the move that really gives you equivalence of polygons in R3. And once you realize that, then it's immediate to see why Reitermeister moves are what connects knots. So let's look at, for example, the move on the left, where you slide the top two edges of a triangle down to the bottom edge and ask, how can this change the picture of the polygon we're looking at when we project down to a plane? So the only things that are going to be affected are parts of the, of the knot which project down to that green triangle. So I've drawn some of those over there. And then you can ask, as you push that vertex down, as you push that those two edges down to the one edge, what happens to these polygons? These are the straight, straight segments in the plane. It's very easy to analyze what happens. When you pass a crossing, when you go through a crossing, you see a type three Reitermeister move. You probably see a type two Reitermeister move. And the type one Reitermeister moves come from looking at the adjacent edges to these two edges. If one of the adjacent edges looks something like this, then you get a type 1 Reitermeister proof. So that's Reitermeister's proof. Yes? Oh, that's, that's essentially the definition of PL equivalence of, of not, for, for polygons in R3. Uh, what you could do essentially is, is well, th so it depends on what your definition of PL knot and PL equivalence of, of curves is. Uh, maybe your definition would be the two polygons are equivalent if there's a piecewise linear ambient isotopy of R3, which takes one to the other. And then you'd have to show that it could be broken up into a sequence of moves like this. But, but this, is, this is essentially a... You could take the top, the top equivalence as the definition of what you mean for po two polygons to be equivalent in R3 as knots, if you can connect them by a sequence of moves of this type. No questions? This is actually going to be useful, this picture later, which is one of the reasons I showed it, because uh, this will enable us to get a bound on how many Reitermeister right moves we need, need to pass from one knot diagram to another. If we have an n-crossing knot, and say we know that it bounds a disk with a certain, we have an n a knot with n vertices and edges, and we know that it bounds a disk with a certain number of triangles, we can slide across those triangles one at a time, just like we did here, and count how many Reitermeister moves we can get every time we slide. Every time we do one of these slides, the number of Reitermeister moves we get will be less than the number of vertices in the, in the polygon plus the number of crossings, which is something like the number of vertices squared. So we can get a count uh, that way, and that's what uh, Jeff Ligarius and I did when we got an upper bound for right moves. Okay, so to get an, 
to get an algorithm out of Reitermeister moves, what we need to do is get an upper bound for how many Reitermeister moves we need to take a diagram and move it to the trivial diagram. So we can ask the question, can we find a function u of n given a n crossing, given a uh, polygon with n vertices or given a knot diagram with n crossings, doesn't really matter which, which you pick, if you have such a thing, can you find a function u of n which gives an upper bound on how many Reitermeister moves you need to transform that n crossing diagram to the trivial diagram with no crossings. Okay, so this would give an algorithm which is to try all possible sequences up to u of n for any diagram and if you get the trivial diagram you're done, otherwise you're, you don't have the unknot. Unfortunately, u of n would, this kind of algorithm is very inefficient, unfortunately. It's worse than exponential. So let's, let's turn to the internet to see what, what they tell us about, about how to unknot things. So it turns out that jewelrysecrets.com, jewelers have this problem of unknotting unknots quite a bit with their chains. And on jewelrysecrets.com, they'll tell us it's not difficult to get rid of a knot. It's just time consuming. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the algorithm. Lay the chain flat. So it says take a diagram of the knot. Use two sewing pins. OK, I, I, don't, quite have a, I don't quite have a translation for that. Uh, and then wiggle the knot out with your two, okay, so what you do is you project the knot to the plane, make the projection regular, right, so you make sure there's only double points in the projection, and then you use Reitermeister moves to get rid of the crossings. So we will follow this advice. So how many Reitermeister moves do we need? Well, our first bound is that we need at least, I'm not used to, to uh, speaking for an hour and a half, so. but I want you to know they, wanted, they asked us to do two hours, so <laughs> we negotiated down to an hour and a half. Uh, anyway, so how many, how big is this function u of n of, which gives an upper bound to the number of Reitermeister moves needed. So it's at least n over 2 because you can get rid of at most two crossings with a Reitermeister move. But this example shows that you need at least n sometimes. Right, so if we take this unknot with n twists, then we can do n Reitermeister type 1 moves to transform it to a trivial knot. So u of n is bigger or equal to n in some cases. How do I know I can't do better than this? See, it's conceivable that there's some clever sequence of moves which will take less than n steps to transform this twist to a trivial knot. This is, this is what makes lower bounds so tricky. Right? Obviously, there's no better way, right? But how do you prove that? Well, to prove it, you, you find an invariant. And in this case, there's an invariant of this diagram, which is n and which changes by at most one for any Reitermeister move. And that is the, the writh. Well, so, so you can't actually do better than n. Sometimes, however, what makes this diagram approach so difficult is that there's classes of knots where you can't monotonically descend down to the trivial knot. So these two knots are examples of, of curves where you have to get, make the knot more complicated first before you can simplify it. So here's an approach to unknotting. 
which people have tried and are still trying today. Why limit yourself to the three Reitermeister moves? Right? Why don't we add some more moves? If, you, know, you can name it after yourself if you like, if you come up with some moves. And maybe if we enlarge the set of moves, then we can monotonically descend to the trivial picture. If we could do that, that would give a very fast algorithm. And we don't know that we cannot do this. So this is a very tempting approach, which, which people have looked at repeatedly. So one possible extra move is the flip. The flip is a, a move which I've tried to illustrate there. So uh, the top row is tra transformed into the second row. And what you can think of is like grab it, put, put the right and left hand pieces of that knot in boxes and then take that right hand box and just twist it through the hole there in the middle. And you'll, you'll create a couple, of, uh, a couple of twists, one at the top and one at the bottom. If you just take that, rotate it around the hole. And so it's a little tricky to visualize, actually. I didn't do a very good picture here. Uh, you may recognize this is the reason why puppets tend, puppet strings tend to get knotted. Right? So you take that, that monkey at the right, and you see that it's twisted around there. It's created a canceling pair of, of twists at the left and the right. That's a flip. And they're quite hard to detect in knot diagrams, but you can see they're not, they're not right amongst the moves. Uh, but maybe if you added those, you would be able to monotonically descend to the trivial knot. Why, why do you say it would be given by Carlos? You use it to detect how you split it up in a few number of ways. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, that's right. Uh, so so I, I maybe mis misspoke. So, so maybe it's not so hard to look for flips, although they may be hidden. Then they may not be immediately apparent in a diagram. But uh, yeah, you could. It wouldn't be exponential. It would be fast. I think polynomial to look for them. Uh, but they, but by themselves, they're not going to be enough to help you with this uh, nodding problem. To, with monotonically descending. So there's been some rec very recent work where four new moves were introduced by. Pentronio and Zanilati. So I'll show you one of their moves here. So these are fairly natural types of moves to try. So you can see a knot at the right, and there's an arc of the knot which, which is shown there, which lies below one piece of the knot and above another piece of the knot. So it's sort of like on an intermediate level. This is the, this is the move Z1. So because it's, it sort of fills in a, a sort of monogon disk, which is disjoint from the knot, you can just pull across that whole monogon. Okay, that's a move you can make that, it's not a Reitermeister move, it's, a, it's put together from a lot of Reitermeister moves, but, but this is an, an extra move you could throw into your toolkit. And they have software that implements these four moves that they've added, and in practice it works remarkably well. It, will simplify knots with, on knots with hundreds of crossings. Can you describe the, so there's a crossing which is in disguise? Or? Well, it's not so in disguise, but uh, roughly the knot fits into these two handle bodies, these two thickened handle bodies that you see at the, at the left. And one of them is above the monogon and the other one's below it. So you can just pull that monogon through without, with a, without creating any crossings. And all of the new moves are of that type? Yeah, they're of that type of, they're of that flavor. So works in practice uh, quite well, but no proof. In fact, I think they now have counterexamples to, to having this always work. Uh, and there's other methods that have been implemented which uh, which also work remarkably well on most examples. Uh, so open question, is there a simple method for unknotting that we've missed so far? Still possible. 
So what about these bounds? Uh, oops, I've, let me move the, the bound here. Uh, the <laughs> there is an exponential upper bound which came out of work uh, that uh, that I did with Ligarius, but but it's been it's just as well it's removed because it's been surpassed now by some beautiful recent work of Mark Lackenby, who showed that you never need to go to use more than 231 n to the 11th Reitermeister moves to, to trivialize a knot with 11 crossings, <laughs> with, 11, with n crossings, n crossings, 231 n to the 11th. Oh yeah, here's, uh, forget about that one. So one, one thing we can do is try and construct a graph of all diagrams of the unknot where we connect to by an edge if there's a Reitermeister move transforming one to the other. And this is a finite, locally finite graph. Very little is known about it, but uh, there is a little bit known. So in the last minute, I'll just say something about lower bounds. Uh, and I'm, I'm going to talk about this this week. There's, it's possible to show that there are unknot diagrams that need more than linearly many Reitermeister moves to mit, transform them to the trivial diagram. In fact, they need at least n squared over 25. But Reitermeister moves have not, have not been a good way to get knot algorithms. So Starting tomorrow, I'll talk about Hawkins' approach for, for uh, normal surfaces that gave a whole class of algorithms, including unknotting. Well, we'll leave that till tomorrow. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. I have one. Maybe I'm just missing something. If you go back a few slides, you have the more complex set of moves. That, that one. The piece. You said each of these is a collection of writers. <laughs> is it not a finite collection? It seems sort of just cheating to group a few of them together. Are you going to get anything significantly different just by. So, so the question is uh, since I remember to repeat it now, is that. Uh, since since these, uh, these moves, this new move is just a finite collection of Reitermeister moves, you know, what, what have we gained by adding new moves? Uh, why don't we just stick with Reitermeister moves? So uh, I, I didn't make this clear, but the point of these is not to count Reitermeister moves or to count moves. It's to get some efficient algorithm for unknotting. That's why they add the new moves. So they're hoping that by adding some new moves, we can go from one diagram to another which has fewer crossings. So if we just restrict to Reitermeister the moves, sometimes we have to make the diagram more complicated before we simplify it. The hope is that with some extra moves, we can just always simplify. And then if we start with n crossings, in n steps, we're at the trivial knot at most. Yes? What, how does it add complexity? Uh, so the question is, if I, if I heard it right, was how do you, what is the complexity in, in an algorithm that looks for these new moves uh, in practice? Is, and uh, I don't really know the answer to that, but they have a preprint on the archives, so presumably they discuss it there, but I don't know off the top of my head what the, complexity is of searching for these types of moves to do. I, I guess your point is that if it's exponentially difficult to find them, then it's not going to be a make for good algorithm. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So I think they were hoping for monotonicity originally. But they've now discovered count examples. But I guess they're more involved than the one we have for radiant moves? Yes. Uh, 
Yeah, the, the, so they picked these moves so that all the known examples would simplify. Yeah. Yes? So the question is, supposing you try to use Reitermeister moves to get an algorithm, yeah. uh, and, it, and the input happened to be nodded, so there was no sequence that changed it, uh, wouldn't that mess up your algorithm? But the, the idea would be you'd compute this function u of n, right? You'd know how many moves in the worst case you'd have to do. So if you try all possible sequences up to u of n, it might take you a long time, but uh, all such sequences, and you know, this would be very this would be very inefficient. But it is a finite process. At the end of which, you can conclude it must be knotted because nothing gave you the unknot. Yes. Is there some consensus where you suggest on what's the number, what's the right sigma for the right of the number? All right. So the question is: Is there some some consensus on what? the number of Reitermeister moves should be for the unknot. So it's, it's less than n to the 11th now and bigger than n squared. Up to, so it's somewhere between those. Which, and uh, uh, yeah, so I, I've, th had, I've been unsuccessful in trying to construct any examples that look like they should be more than quadratic. So that would be my guess would be n squared, but I don't think that's a consensus. So, yeah. Yes? Are there any, in terms of the number of extra crossings that you need to add, like, so maybe your yes. x squared is just cycling along the same number of crossings for a long time and then going down. Right. Um, what's the worst example that you know of in terms of the number of extra crossings that you ever need? Right. So, so I think the, the grid diagrams more or less give you an n squared upper bound for the number of crossings. There's a, this Dinikov algorithm based on grid diagrams gives you an upper bound, which is n squared, I think. So I'm, I'm after a lower bound. So as in what, what's, what's, like, what's, what's uh, the pathological Do you know any examples of the more than one extra crossing? I see. So the question is, do we know any good examples where you start with an n crossing or not, and any sequence that takes it to the trivial knot has to go up at least this much uh, by a lot. Uh, Even more than one would make me happy. More than one. More than one, I think we can do. <laughs> uh, I think some of those examples I showed take you up uh, by like uh, two. No, more than that. <laughs> but something like n over 10 or something like that, uh, I would think. But uh, I don't know offhand. <laughs>